Tilburg University and Mind Labs present Taisig Talks. Welcome. This is uh, the 16th edition of the Taisig Talks. My name is Peter Sponk. Uh, I will be uh, chairing this talk. So I have uh, two guests today, uh, Jegos Schupa and Chris Emery, who are specialists in the area of deep learning. The reason that I wanted to do deep learning for this particular talk is that the AI has got a lot of attention in recent years, and there's kind of a revolution that started around 2014, 2016, and that revolution was, um, was the seed of that revolution was the deep learning technology. And we see this in many places, in many applications in society and in research. And uh, because many people know that this is the case, and, or they at least know that AI has become very important, I think it makes sense to try to discuss on a higher level what deep learning actually is, why it is so important, what it can do for us, what the limitations are, and we can delve into several applications of it and, and examine those. So, welcome. Um, can I ask you to quickly introduce yourself, Jegos? Go ahead. Thanks for having me, Peter. My name is Grzegorz Upawa. I, I work at the um, Department of uh, Cognitive Science and AI at Tilburg University. And yeah, I work on um, uh, uh, deep learning applied to multi-language and, um, and uh, similar things. I also uh, teach a couple of courses. Uh, Chris Emery, I'm a lecturer. From next month on, I will be an assistant professor also at the Department of Cognitive Science and AI. Um, my work mostly focus, it's like on the intersection between sort of privacy, security, machine learning, natural language processing combined. Um, mostly sort of generally interested in, in uh, how algorithms have negative effects on us as a society. Okay, yeah, that fits actually Tilburg University very well yeah. because we do both <laughs> the technological side of things, but also the, the ethical and legal and societal aspects of, uh, of AI. So Indeed. I'm glad that you're here as well. Uh, can I ask one of you to, uh, to try to explain without any sheets uh, what uh, <coughs> deep learning is? What, what should we think? So... Okay, no, okay. You're probably the, the big specialist that we have in the house. <laughs> yeah, well, so deep learning is a, is a kind of a more recent synonym for uh, for neural networks, and um, uh, deep learning uh, and neural networks are just a type of uh, machine learning technique where um, which uh, the name deep comes from the fact that there is uh, usually several layers of uh, processing uh, of the input before the output is uh, is produced. And like most uh, machine learning um, algorithms, deep learning works by uh, learns from were, uh, by learning from examples. So you give it some examples of uh, inputs and outputs that uh, that you know are correct, and uh, based on best based on these examples, uh, machine learning algorithms ex extract some uh, some rules or some features or some uh, some uh, correlations bet uh, between uh, inputs and outputs, and are then able to to reproduce this function from the input to the output. And uh, deep learning is uh, um, the, the special thing about it is that, uh, that that indeed it does it in several steps usually. So you have, uh, as I said, several layers of processing where gradually the input is converted into a form, uh, into an internal representation, which makes it easier to solve the problem, makes it easier to produce a desired output. And, uh, and um, another thing which is important uh, in deep learning is that, um, um, it's a it's a technique which allows uh, often to solve the problem in an end-to-end -end way. So, for example, if you have a um, if you have if you want, want to work on uh, something like uh, labeling images, you just give it a, the um, the input image in terms of like the matrix of pixels it has, and you give it the um, output labels that you might want to have. For example, describing what's in the image. And uh, and uh, internally, the um, this uh, type of uh, method produces internal representations, which kind of convert the image in, in, uh, into some into some other representation, which makes it easier to uh, decide what the what what is in it. Uh, but it's uh, it's it's learning directly from uh, from the out from from um, and it makes a mistake. You you 
tell it what should be the correct label, and then it uh, just updates its own parameters in a, in a, in a way that uh, that everything is uh, becoming more correct over time. And so there are no like uh, you're not doing it manual. You're not doing it by manually defining different layers of of different steps of the process. Everything there are different steps internally, but you're not defining them manually. It's all learned end to end. I think that's like kind of a high level, um, high level summary. Yeah, but you had some terminology that not not be clear to everybody because you mentioned neural network, for instance. And I know I studied AI neural networks, uh, tech technology from the nineteen eighties, nineteen nineties. It was really popular there. So, um, and people often say that neural networks like a human brain, but I assume that is not the case. A human brain might be a very global analogy, but. Uh, uh, to what extent would, would would you learn that representation that you talk about uh, in yeah. in such a neural network? So I think it's on at the at the very at the very high level uh, there is some similarity <coughs> uh, to the brains of animals, uh, but I think that the term neural network comes from a more local uh, type of analogy where. Um, uh, there are neurons uh, in, in animal brains which are connected uh, among themselves, so they form a network. And I think uh, one way of uh, thinking about uh, deep learning is also involves that kind of analogy that there are like there are parameters in the network. You can think uh, about these parameters as uh, as connections or weights between different units. And uh, I think um, that has in the past been like a very kind of uh, most common uh, motivation for for why we should be doing things uh, in, in this particular form, but uh, just a equally an equal equally valid perspective would be to think about uh, you know uh, uh, neural networks as fu uh, differentiable function compositions or any other type of uh, analogy that you can come come up with. So I think the there is a connection historically to to brains and to to, to neurons. But it's kind of a loose analogy, and uh, it, uh, uh, I don't think uh, I don't think it's the only way of thinking about them that uh, that is uh, the most useful, necessary, always. But is deep learning always involving in neural network, or is it can it also be something else? Well, it depends. I think a newer like if as long as you have like a, um, you you have um, some multi-dimensional. Uh, representation which you which you project to a different multi-dimensional representation you can think of this kind of projection from one matrix to another as a neural network but uh, I it's not like literally a network like it's just a vector algebra in in a computer so literally in terms of hardware it's not any type of network but it can be a, an analog of that in a, so in that sense yes every kind of deep learning is almost always can be uh, visualized or thought about as a as a, as a neural network. Okay, and, and so it's always a mapping from input to output, and you learn that mapping, is that what is happening? It's not always like that, but it's it's almost, it's very frequently like that, and that's, I think, the easiest way of thinking about it and coming up with examples. But uh, you, you, I think there, in some cases, there, there are some exceptions, but uh, it's not getting to them. Weren't you one of the first ones introducing it in the department? I don't know, probably. <laughs> no. I think Jaguars probably was. Oh, okay, the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but I, as I said, as far as I know, the technology existed already for quite a while before it, it became this revolution. So why did this happen? Want me to answer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so that I think there's a, there, was, there were a few things at play. So... Uh, most of these techniques were developed around, uh, I guess, the 90s. That, that's where all the seminal work is from. Um, but at the time, the computers weren't powerful enough to, to run these algorithms yet. So you can imagine that the larger these networks become, the more sort of space they occupy on, on whatever PC or something you're running it on. So while I guess theoretically people knew that these things were powerful enough to do sort of like, yeah, making general representations of particular data, um, the computers were kind of behind in terms of processing power. Um, so I guess, you know, the, the, the big uh, names in, in what is now deep learning were just sitting on this for quite a while thinking that, okay, at some point, 
you know, Moore's law is going to kick in. We'll have this sort of increased computing power, and then we can actually see if this works. Um, and that was, I think, around the time that that I started doing my uh, my PhD. This got you know up to steam. There were um, people curating larger data sets because that's also something that was holding it back for some time. So sure, like you can have these very powerful um, systems to represent things, but you also need a lot of data to then do that um, to to actually train from, right? So smaller data sets don't work that well. So two components, I guess, so like large data sets and a lot of computing power. So I think at the time it was ImageNet, correct me if I'm wrong, that was sort of the, the main thing that sort of was the first, um, what we call a benchmark data set. So it's a basically, a, a, you know, the ImageNet is a, is a data set of, of images with labels. Um, like? I don't know, horse. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> there's a picture this is, this of a horse. The image. <laughs> yes, and, there, and there's a horse in the picture. Uh, so there might be categories, and then later people went into sort of describing the picture a bit more in detail. But this was the main thing. And, and I guess it's nice from sort of an application point of view. You can also see it in your phone now, I guess, if you search for a particular term. Then, then your photo library automatically filters out things in you know this view. It's kind of like that. That was the, the goal, at least. So, and and you know, in, in computer vision, which which is the the research field that deals with this, um, people try to. There were like sort of all these little components that people would combine to then do this classification. And it wasn't really like a, a main algorithm to do it. There were like things to extract features. There was an algorithm that would then learn from these features and try to do something. And, and once this data set got more traction with people actually running neural networks and being able to do it within a time that you are still alive, <laughs> once it finishes, um, um, they actually got pretty good what, what we call accuracy. So it's like, how good can we actually classify all these these objects and these images? And then then it was like, wow, okay, this actually is now happening that that these neural networks have now um, superseded the 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 manual kind of like intelligent design of these. Well, according to the research, at least, um, and that's when things started rolling. People started sort of developing uh, special, um, more of sort of tailored things. You know, the, the what we call feed forward neural network is the most uh, basic instantiation, I guess, typically at least. <clears throat> but people started coming up with with ways to rep because this worked for um, for simple classification, but for as Jaguar also mentioned, for images you have different representations than, for example, for a language, let's say. So people started tailoring um, specific algorithms to specific types of input or, or, or uh, domains, right? So images, text, uh, I don't know, graphs, this kind of stuff. So, and and from there on, it's it's been sort of a race of who can get sort of the main, like, because still these were old ideas, right? That were implemented. Um, and I think only from the last, I guess five, six years, people have started introducing sort of new, new, newer systems that that um, that actually prove more powerful than stuff that was already done in the nineties. So. Yeah, I think a lot of this initially was a rediscovery of old techniques yeah. uh, due to availability of compute, like uh, uh, like uh, Chris mentioned, but also to to the availability of large data sets. And large data sets, I think, uh, to a large to a very large extent were enabled by the rise of the internet and like the, the, the fact that people are sharing things on the internet so you know, like the way to get like millions of images with labels uh, you know it's a it's it's just an issue of scale like when people are sharing them on uh, uh, social media then you can collect them and uh, and use them the same with text the same with uh, a lot of other things uh, so yeah so initially this was enabled by by these two main factors and uh, people starting applying things like uh, convolutional neural networks or long short short-term memory networks to different problems and they started to work really well which attracted more attention from other researchers and I think that that's this kind of a snow, snowball effect that you have more people interested in this working on this and starting coming up with uh, with new techniques and new approaches and I think uh, nowadays like there are so many people working on this that there's definitely a, a lot of new 
ideas and uh, and new contributions not only rediscovery of techniques from the 80s and the 90s yeah. but the definitely new developments which are we probably can't keep up with uh, uh, you know in general <laughs> in deep learning but in our own domain usually you know it's quite visible that there are new things that uh, that also uh, make big jump make uh, uh, account for big jumps in in the, in the performance of these yeah. systems yeah that, uh, i would like to know slightly more about the technology because I've been working with neural networks when I did my PhD, which is already a while ago. And then um, I worked with some master students and we built some neural networks. And usually it was, I don't know, uh, 10 inputs, one output, uh, up to 100 nodes in the network. And that was already pretty big and it took a long time to train. And I, when you look at these neural networks, um, every node that you add almost makes it exponentially more complex because you get all these extra connections in there. And if you talk about Moore's law, law then, well, it's not a law, it's an observation basically, but it, it helps. But still, that, that says every year and a half or so, the computer power doubles in capacity and in, uh, in speed. But I would think that that would not be enough to within 10 years go from these relatively small neural networks that I was using to these gigantic networks that are currently in deep learning. So what I understand that, that point that you make about the data sets, but that I would think that the hardware technology or the, or the software technology should also have seen some changes. Yeah, I think there is uh, issues with you know hardware definitely also like uh, being able to distribute it over over many nodes, so called, right? So over many machines and many. Uh, uh, processors on the same machine also in terms of like how you design the network you if you add, you don't want to just add a node and connect it to everything you typically you know you have modu little modules which are connected uh, internally but are only connected partially with uh, with the rest of the network so that uh, that uh, um, that allows and you also design it and uh, design them in a way that you can do stuff in a modular way so you can distribute things more easily so one example is a is a kind of a recent development called the transformer well not so recent anymore i guess but anyway <laughs> <laughs> not from the 90s right uh, as a transformer which i like the the main idea behind is that that uh, is that um or one of the main contributions that it that it made was it enabled the scaling of of these networks because it's very easy to parallelize thing a lot of computations can be done in parallel on multiple machines and then that that makes it uh, possible to to you know train a, a network if you have a thousand machines with i don't know a billion parameters or something like that so uh, there is a combination of different things more you know where uh, these uh, uh, big uh, um, a lot of companies now have like you know, access to to a lot of uh, computation because uh, they uh, they make business that way. Uh, we have techniques to parallelize things, and we have uh, smart, you know, design to of these networks to to make them possible to run at scale. Okay, and yeah, you already mentioned, for instance, image classifications or uh, describing what we see in an image. And um, I, when that came up, I thought it was surprising. And when I look back on it nowadays, I think, well, that's actually pretty simple <laughs> but there are many more things that have been made possible now can, can you give a couple more yeah, examples of things that we a, couldn't do 10 years it's ago it's always like that right? once, yeah. you, once the machine starts being able to do it you know it's actually simple <laughs> but it's not simple it's not at all simple it's very complicated and that's why it took you know since the we had some first computers in the in, in the 50s until now that it can actually be done you know so these things are not at all simple they're like extremely difficult but we are also not simple right like mammals we recognize things in images effortlessly. It's 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 you know it's something that we are born to do. Uh, but again, we are. It's not simple. We don't really necessarily know in detail how how we do that or how you know a, a dog does it or a hawk does it. So uh, so the, the so yeah, that, that's that's. But we know a bit about it. how the computer will do it. Right? We know we know more or less how a computer does it, right? But it's not it's not it's not, it's not something trivial. But other examples of things that that uh, were not possible, let's say, twenty years ago, are now possible now. I think uh, from kind of something that I am a bit more familiar with is uh, machine translation or translating from one language to another, right? Like uh, at a level that you basically can understand and you don't uh, you don't need a person to actually correct it much. Uh, so you still you still uh, you know the, these systems make some small mistakes and sometimes some big mistakes, really. But uh, it's it's uh, for most 
pairs of languages. You can you can give it a text or a paragraph or even a longer text, and uh, it will output something which is completely fine. You know, it sounds uh, sounds uh, natural. It uh, it conveys the ideas in the in the in the other language. Uh, with some small glitches sometimes, but uh, definitely good enough to be completely usable yeah. and, uh, for an everyday. Yeah, I know the university actually uh, sometimes writes message in, the, uh, in in Dutch and then mm. they just throw it to Google Translate, which then gives you a, uh, or another translation mm. tool, which gives you the English version. Mm. But the funny thing is that it then also translates the, <laughs> the undersigned name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are some glitches, but you know, you should, have, you should have tried like to use machine translation 20 years ago it was complete gibberish like yeah, yeah. not you know it was ungrammatical first of all and like completely crazy yeah. so it's a so there is a, a, a huge jump you know in, in this in this time period that has been that has happened and you know you always focus on the things which are still, miss, still missing and there are definitely you know much room for improvement always but you also you know you shouldn't lose sight of how much actually we are able to do now that we couldn't um other examples uh mm -hmm. Do you have an yeah, or? yeah. I think I mean I I always like to use whatever you have to to demonstrate these things. So like your phone is always an uh, amazing example of of all this AI stuff that is sort of hidden behind what you generally use. So let's take your your camera. Any sort of sort of small smart optimizations that are in. A uh, smartphone camera that all happens with some like com computer vision uh, techniques, or you know, part of it actually. Um, <clears throat> uh, any things that are are sort of served via the internet, so search engines, the ranking of of items is done via some smart systems. Um, you can, you know, if you if you look at a video. You can, for example, turn on this automatic captioning uh, things that yeah. has also had like quite a big leap, uh, especially for English, yeah. uh, where it's if, if you're a native speaker, it's actually quite accurate in terms of uh, automatic. So I'm going to get like, yeah, I, 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 I turned it on by accident during my last lecture and it started on the type. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Subtitling me. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and, and, and there's always quirks, right? But if you compare it to, to systems that we even had like five years ago, there's such tremendous leaps in quality um, within like controlled environments, obviously. But um, yeah, so, you know, uh, whatever we have in terms of um, uh, engines for, for doing, uh, for example, computer game AI that has improved quite a bunch. If I compare it to, you know, sort of the, the starting 2000s AI where it was mostly um, um, sort of rule based. We we there's been research into um, AI that that is quite competitive with with professional players. You know, uh, self driving cars are something that that um, that you know even if you even if it's not fully functional, you can even you can just say that this wasn't something we could do from from 10 years ago we wouldn't no that definitely has typically. improved but I, I actually wanted to bring up that example because um i've been looking a little bit into the self-driving cars and how far they go and mostly because i was pretty annoyed with someone like elon musk who's every year claiming that next year we will have full self-driving and he's been claiming that since 2015 hmm. uh today he's still claiming that but all the other uh producers of cars who were doing self-driving a couple of weeks ago, they said it's probably never going to happen, full self-driving. Now, of course, you can make it happen by just redefining what full self-driving actually means. Mm. But it seems that there's now a lot of skepticism about whether or not something like full self-driving is actually possible. Um, now, you might not be a specialist in this, but I, I would think there are certain applications that are out of reach of something like deep learning so are there things like that are there things that we can imagine so that's probably not gonna happen good should i start no, can get <laughs> okay, yeah now, no. we, now we get a whole list <laughs> <laughs> no so um i once you start applying ai in in real life where it's more um invasive things start to become a bit problematic, right? You have to actually deal with how noisy the world is. And self-driving is a very good example where we 
I, I had a brief discussion with the Jaguars this uh, last week, I think, about this, that um, we, we obviously have laws and stuff that apply while, while we drive. And driving is quite a, you know, involved cognitive task, right? You have to not only remember that there are certain rules and, and, and some things might override certain rules, but you also have to deal with that not everything is a boring highway where there's just like cars going like four. There's, there's a, a, a very wide spectrum of things that might happen. And the car, if you want to have full self-driving capability, has to react to this in a way that is what? Is that like, according to the law, is it, is it something that is beneficial for the driver? Is it something that's beneficial to the driver plus everyone around it? So typically we wouldn't want to avoid things that, that, that kill the driver and their other people. Um, and, and these self-driving cars now still have to operate within an environment where things aren't self-driving. So you can like coordinate or something. Even sort of getting a car from a, from a parking lot, there's so much stuff that can happen there and, and basically anything can be a kid that, that yes. crosses and, and it has to hit the brakes immediately because uh, if it's an unknown object, then better brake, right? That's the most safe to stop driving. So um, I think from that, it's very, it's difficult to imagine uh, um, the, the sort of utopian self-driving component within our existing sort of law systems and, and how we'd like to have it mimic human driving where we know it's flawed, right? Yeah. So, and, and operating within this very noisy, quite complex system seems to me like it's quite a reach still. But if suppose I would say we can't do it because we don't have the training set. Well, it would that we don't have a data set that you can use to train it, or or I think yeah, that's that's one of one of the I think one of the points. Uh, yeah, I, so this is so driving cars and other kind of robotics applications are 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 an example of something which is a little bit quite different from you know classical. Uh, deep learning applications where like, you know, you classify images or you translate a text or you recognize speech or you do things which are kind of virtual in nature, right? This is a, this is a, an agent which is acting in the world. It has real effect on the world. So getting this data, like tr to train it is, is more difficult because things happen, have to happen in real time. And uh, it's a, it's, they have real effects, right? Uh, so uh, if you let a self-driving car uh, run around the city and uh, to collect data, it can you know kill someone or injure someone, and that's you know not something you want to do. It's not the same when the, when a you know a image classifier makes a mistake. It just makes a mistake. Mm. So nothing happens. You tell it what the correct answer is, and you keep training. Right? You cannot do exactly the same with a self-driving car. You have to come come up with some simulation environment or something like that, and then transfer those skills to the real world. That's uh, that's one reason I think why it's working less well. Another reason is that the the, the threshold for defining what it means to work well is so high, right? Because it, uh, human lives are at stake. Mm -hmm. We have very very little tolerance for mistakes. We have you know much higher tolerance for mistakes when we're translating text, right? Some something is is wrongly translated. Most of the time, it's just okay. You know, small glitch, nothing nothing happens. If there's a small glitch in a in a in a car which is driving around the city, it could kill someone. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for that reason, I think. It's just, a, it's just a much harder problem. Yeah, but people also argue, of course, this is very cynical arguing, uh, people make uh, uh, cause accidents as well. And if, as long as a self-driving car causes less less accidents than what people do, well, we should allow to, them. But it's hard to measure, right? You <laughs> yes. don't know in, in advance. You have to kind of let these cars loose and, uh, uh, and to kind of figure out whether they're making more. Or less. I, I was actually thinking that self-driving with... Now we maybe as talk about the solution. It, it would be possible if we only have self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. Would be easier, yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I yeah, but then you have to then we go into more of uh what is the what is the critical point? There is there is some sort of like worst case scenario in this, right? Where everything is optimized <laughs> to each other, where the whole system fails and everything starts crashing it exists somewhere there in the so so 
then we would have to get into, I guess, more of a philosophical debate of, <laughs> of do we then have fill switches and, and are we confident enough that they work? And, and um, yeah. Yeah, so this is, but then we talk about a certain risk that happens if you automate too much, somebody can hack the system and then Indeed. create a huge problem. And, yeah. and yeah. yeah, but that that's actually not what I had planned to talk about mm. today. <laughs> but we can talk about that as well if you want. Um, but um, because now we, we came up with self-driving a couple of times and you would say actually general robotics is something that is basically deep learning is not, not enough to to solve that. Are there other examples that you would like to bring up? Because otherwise I would like to speculate more about this, but... Uh, yeah. uh, no, I think, yeah, I, I mean, we can probably think of uh, examples, but it's, uh, I, I think that's like this general area of things where there, it's not so easy to get training data, right? Like when, whenever there is like data scarcity of some sort, whether it's due to, you know, this being like an application involving interaction with the real world or whether it's just uh, being due to like, there's just not being enough data at all. Like, so we can... Uh, so for my own um, uh, domain of, uh, of language, you know, there a lot of uh, these applications work very well for like common languages, like, and, uh, which a lot of people speak like Chinese or English yes. or Spanish. Uh, there's a lot of data that have, has been collected and these, uh, these you know, it works very well uh, most of the time. But, you know, there are a lot of languages that only like a few hundred people speak and they maybe don't even say that much, right? Like necessarily. So uh, so for those, like they, people are able to kind of learn the language in that kind of, the, in that kind of situation. But our deep learning systems currently cannot. They, they need like a lot of, uh, much more data than humans to, to get uh, to some useful kind of performance. And uh, so that's another example, which is not related to robotics, but has another type of data scarcity built in. But, but I, okay, I, I could imagine because that would be actually the follow-up question that I would have in general is the okay, other things that we could add to deep learning or maybe add next to deep learning, which would allow us to do more of these things. And as, in particular, if you talk about something like a language spoken only by 100 people, if we put a human between those 100 mm -hmm. people, after a while, they will get better and better at that language so mm -hmm. i can imagine that you have a different kind of learning system which could do that because right. is deep learning really dependent on big data sets or could you well, yeah it? current current ways of doing deep learning are definitely they need much more data than a, than a, than a human uh, human being in a comparable situation for language at least maybe for not for other things but you know, also for driving i think a typical person mm -hmm. In their you know twenties can learn to drive with like you know as as little as twenty hours of practice right like um, that's probably <laughs> just a very small that's fraction of what a one. of what a of <laughs> type of data that that, that the you know uh, AI system would need so so definitely like uh, you know hum as as humans uh, or and many other animals are similar we have had like millions of years of evolution which has kind of built in already certain um, abilities uh, you know into our nervous system and uh, so that is not something that uh, that we that is not how uh, deep learning works right it's kind of mm -hmm. like a very generic you define some generic architecture but other than that is basically you're basically starting from scratch it's a blank slate so there's mm -hmm. a lot of you need a lot of uh, uh, training data in order for the systems to reach uh, you know, as a, some level of, of performance that, uh, um, so like you asking what could we add? Well, of course we can add more, what are called learning priors, right? So some kind of hard coded or preferences for certain things that would make it easier for them to learn a language, for example, right? Because if the, if the um, structure or the innate preferences of, um, of a deep learning system were more similar to how, uh, the human brain is, then they would also find it easier to to learn from smaller amounts of data. But uh, mm -hmm. the, the thing is that it has it's an idea which which has been around for a long time, but it hasn't really been easy to implement because you know uh, we cannot reproduce evolution easily uh, because uh, it takes you know, it's computationally extremely expensive to do that, uh, and uh, so we have some other workarounds, but um, nothing nothing so far has really. Um, from from this idea has we really, uh, kind of made a big big difference. No, yeah, I can imagine that since there's so much success with deep learning at the moment that people say, well, I'm just going to build some more application with deep learning because yeah. I know I get a success rather than research yeah. things which might 
maybe give a success in 10 years or something like that? Yeah, I think that, you know, the low hanging fruit is scaling. Like, so we, for a lot of languages, we do have a lot of data for a lot of, you know, uh, things like, uh, um, like, uh, I don't know, uh, biological applications. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of data out there. And so we just have to, uh, or, you know, people who are doing that, they, the, they're just doing the things that already are possible with, with current uh, technology, just, uh, just you know, scaling it up to these big data sets because, uh, because they can achieve very good results and very practical and useful things without, uh, you know, having to hard, like having to think very hard about, uh, about new ideas and how to, how to, how to make them work. That's, that's very difficult, right? It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't come, it doesn't happen every year that someone comes with a brilliant new idea that, you know, revolutionizes some, some field. Yeah. I, so just to add, I think if we had a good idea about what to add, then we would not share it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be sitting here. Right? Uh, no, I think, I mean, there's been some, some recent papers, uh, I, remember one recent one by uh, Jan Lekun where it, he tries to reason about which components will be necessary to get sort of the existing deep learning algorithms into sort of the next step, which is typically adding some, if I remember correctly, because I've mostly seen this flyby on Twitter rather than actually read it in detail, but there's, you know, uh, longstanding things like better sort of memory, world knowledge, representations, yeah. uh, some sort of, uh, yeah, teacher, oracle interactions, yes. certain uh, playgrounds and, yeah. and ways to synthesize data. Um, and then these are all components that I think are individually studied and, and haven't really been like these ideas, again, are not new. Right, they, no, no. they've existed in AI for quite a while, <clears throat> um, but it, a good implementation that has demonstrated to work isn't there yet. So, um, but I, I I think all these ideas ha probably have some some value to them. It's just the the combination and implementing in it into something that indeed mm. scales to such large data sets is, that that doesn't exist yet. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, can I, I would like to talk a bit about computational creativity because that's also driven by these deep neural networks uh, as far as I can see. And we've seen these systems coming up in, uh, in recent times, uh, started with DALI and then DALI 2, and then we get variations of that and we mm. get easily accessible. And um, this, uh, we have uh, the, the language systems like uh, GPT, which has several... Um, several iterations um, and well I, I talked about that a bit earlier that I said okay when you look back it's actually things are less impressive and impressive once they're done and mm -hmm. actually I see these things and then I think my first instinct is oh this is incredible and then I look a bit closer and I think actually it's not that impressive what I see here and I see some mistakes in here so what, what's your idea about this what's your opinions yeah, I think it's it's you know it's kind of, it's kind of how how it works with people, right? We see we see the we impressed at first and then we less impressed while um, when when we kind of see the little glitches and, and yeah, when I see the in in the image eye stock suddenly we so I think mm -hmm. okay, the computer just put an eye stock image in there and then <laughs> yeah, but I mean why wouldn't it, right? It's uh... <laughs> well, it, it should, but if it understood for, the image, it would remove that text. Yeah, because for for a computer like you know these uh, this part of its world, right? Like you 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 have never told it that the, these watermarks are something that shouldn't be there like they just see images like think you know put yourself in the in the uh in the place of this uh, of this uh of the system right you just you just don't interact with the world in any other way you just through other than through this training data and the training data like you know i don't know some percentage of the images have watermarks on them which is ice talks or whatever shutter stuff mm. or something like that and so for you it's like a natural part of the texture of many objects you know and, and that's uh <laughs> that's why it does it so i think that's maybe not a not a brilliant example but there are other things you know like maybe like sometimes you you see a hand with uh, six uh, fingers instead of five you know like these, these things are think are you can you can you can you can think that this is kind of less justified right like as a mistake and uh, so like counting th counting objects often I think it's a little bit uh, a little bit iffy for yeah. And it's from the newspaper, for instance. They had some. They gave some example where they wanted a robot as a painter, and you show your robot there, and the arms were not connected to the mm -hmm. robot. And 
an artist would have made that, if they would have done it, would have made that decision deliberately. But mm-hmm. for the computer, it's just generated. Yeah, yeah as, again, I think this is a kind of problem, you know, we would speculate that this is related to how these uh, systems interact with the world. They don't interact with the world other than through these kind of uh, image, images and, and, and textual de- descriptions of these images. So it's like, it's you know, a person probably has a much better uh, understanding of how things are connected in the world because it's uh, it's it's interacts with ob- with real objects it's uh, it has like uh, it has some uh, they have some um, naive physics understanding of uh, of how object uh, objects behave in the world none of this is present uh, uh, in this system other than you know as a kind of like a, a very tenuous side effect of of just looking at, at you know, gazillions of images and, and textual des- descriptions. I think if, uh, you know, the systems which, uh, which would uh, watch videos probably would be a little bit better because it sees, continu- they would be able to see continuity in time and how things uh, are, you know. Is that much, much, much harder to analyze and to uh, learn from? Or? No, I think it's just less okay. easy to scale, right? Like, because, if, you know, instead of having a single image, you have, uh, I don't know, Depending on the on the frame rate uh, between twenty five and a couple of hundred uh, of uh, you know images per second, so so it's just a lot of more data that you need to, uh, to need to process. But but again, like you know, you have more information, and so the more information and the more aspects of the world these systems uh, will have uh, access to and be able to uh, to get information from, the better they will get. And I think these kind of glitches will you know become rarer. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, one of our colleagues actually uh, was interviewed recently in the newspaper and uh, he uh, he remarked upon the impressiveness of what we can do now, which, which is purely validated. And he said, well, maybe in 10 years we can generate movies this way. And I was thinking, I don't see that happening, generating movies, because uh, first of all, you cannot just, uh, let's say, learn a general structure from observing a bunch of movies you cannot generate a new movie movie on that basis and also movies are like they are definitely 3d even if they're projected today mm. the it's a 3d projection so you have to learn complete objects in some way mm-hmm. so what do you think would, would 10 years uh, of course 10 years is so far <laughs> in the future in ai that uh, you can always say well i don't know or maybe but uh uh, we'll be making predictions. We have to uh, meet again in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still alive by then, I hope. So. <laughs> I, I would say that probably generating like short cartoons already is probably possible. Uh, yeah. So yeah, but those are usually 2D. Yeah. Well, no, you still have occlusion with yes, objects and, and so on, right? Like have a lot of things. Several levels. And okay. uh, yeah, I would say in 10 years, definitely we can have like at least like, you know, shortish, uh, reasonable clips. I would, I would be, I would bet... Uh, that that's going to be possible. Uh, the, I think it also depends on on whatever you uh, classify as a movie. Right? Yeah, there's there, and and I just wanted to tie into this too with with your previous question. Given these, <clears throat> there's now a lot of systems that based on and that's GPT three is an example of this, but also, for example, stable diffusion um, generations. That these are all sort of prompt driven, right? So there's a yeah little text that people enter as a sort of a starting point and then either it comes out like a picture or more text. And I think where we are sort of inclined to not even uh, having the the input and, and output side by side, but I think just the, the surprise of things that are generated sort of appeal to us in a way. Um, I think stable diffusion was used to to win some sort of modern art uh, yes. uh, competition a few weeks ago. Um, but if you look at that picture, it looks really like it is visually pleasing. It looks nice. Indeed, if you zoom in, you see these irregularities. But the that's not that's not what we focus on, right? We focus on the main thing, and we look at it and think, "Wow, this is spectacular!" Like this is not something that that we're used to. There's a lot of obviously a lot of copying involved with these these algorithms, but you can also argue that there's also a lot of like new things we as humans, uh, being artists, also are inspired by certain genres, styles, techniques, etc. So that also you know takes some time to deviate from from these things and come up with something completely novel, whereas these things are basically some sort of uh, you know eight ball with give me some. Um, or some randomizer would give me something in this style, and now it's like, 
very interesting to look at, but but it is a bit boring in a sense from that that it mostly comes up with with yeah sort of abstract interesting things that only have some sort of quality because either you're impressed by the algorithm or you're impressed by the fact that it's so not on not like anything a human would produce right um and and i think with with your uh, um the movie question it would be the same thing that yeah if you uh, treat this as some sort of avant-garde movie yeah, it's probably okay. quite easy to be yeah, impressed. Sure. Oh man, like you just fake that you're some director and you put together this thing and people will be very impressed. But doing like a blockbuster, yeah, that's probably you need you need indeed all these things that you mentioned, like a stable script. There needs to be things and they, they follow up in some sort of logical order, some story going on that needs some conclusion and like a, you know. Well, a lot of the a lot of the stuff that's good is not as coherent. No, that's true. No. But I, I was actually talking this afternoon to uh, to a woman who's in game development, and she works for a commercial company in that respect. And she told me she said, "Look, artists make concepts for us." And, and actually, I know that in game development of the, the game development cycle, seventy percent of the money goes into art, mm. uh, and only something like fifteen percent into programming. And she said, well, the artists, so we asked them to make concepts and they now use these kind of tools and usually it took them a month and now they do it in a day, which made me think, okay, so many artists are going to lose their jobs now because. <laughs> um, yeah, or maybe they will just adapt to that and will collaborate. Well, some artists will get better jobs, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. It's the same with translators and with a lot of professions, which, you know, which you can automate now. I think, you know, like their translators are now uh, probably, um, you know, doing like proofread proofreading or post, post editing or not doing like not translating from scratch. And it's probably with a lot of artists, they won't be like, you know, manually painting every single frame of a cartoon, but, you know, they would just uh, maybe give some general instructions and the, and the, uh, uh, AI system will fill in the details and the rest. So I'm not sure uh, how what the economic impact will be on the profession. Probably in the short term, a lot of people lose their maybe their job, but in the in the long term, probably people adapt to technology in, in ways that have always kind of adapted, right? Like just uh, start collaborating with the machine in a way that is that is more productive. Yeah, we still have a, a lack of uh, people in in. in for jobs we, we still have lots of vacancies so <laughs> probably <laughs> it's not not bad if we lose a, a couple of things that we don't need to do anymore um so when when i talked to you before and uh, and i mentioned a couple of applications you came up with something that i hadn't heard of at the time but immediately after that i started seeing uh, and that was alpha fold um and actually um Something like in 2005, 2006, I think there was an application called Folded where humans collaborate with computers to create uh, protein foldings, which uh, could be very useful. And what they found is that humans actually did it better than computers, but you could teach computers the same techniques that humans used and the computers became better as well. And then you mentioned AlphaFold. <laughs> And, and I was I was quite impressed when I heard that. So can can you because if people don't know about this, I think it's worthwhile yeah, mentioning this. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting thing because uh, the other examples that we've been talking about so far is, is but things, maybe also talk a bit about the application. I will, there. I yeah, will yeah, yeah sure. That uh, that uh, are things that people actually kind of can do, like recognize images or translate or. Yeah. Uh, but this is something that people maybe are not so good at. Like, you no. Know, so the idea is to. Uh, from the uh, sequence of amino acids in a protein determine its uh, three-dimensional structure. So proteins consist of amino acids. Amino acids are just uh, these little building blocks that there are about 20 of them or so. And uh, they are like basically chained together uh, you know, from, a, from tens to hundreds to thousands of, uh, of, of amino acids in a protein. And then uh, just the physics and chemistry of, uh, of, uh, of these amino acids makes the protein fold into a three-dimensional shape. And the three-dimensional shape of a protein is very, very important because it determines its function. So if you have an enzyme or, or, a, or a drug or, or anything that uh, is functional, 
that's basically determined by its uh, three-dimensional structure, like what, what you know, how it's, uh, what is the exact shape? Does it fit in this particular uh, other protein, uh, and and so on? So this is like an extremely important uh, thing in, in in biology, in medicine, and and so on, and, and other similar applications. And uh, and it's a very difficult problem. The, you know, there is like exponentially many, you know, theoretically. Uh, uh, ways that the protein can can fold itself, uh, but only one. In, in reality, in yeah. reality, only typically a very small number of those are like stable, and uh, and uh, only one is typically the one that that ends up uh, that ends up being the free, the real three dimensional shape of a protein. And so, uh, so as you mentioned, the, the, there has been a lot of work on this pro, uh, on this problem for for many years, and like the relatively slow progress. Uh, but um, um, in 2018, there have been actually a big jump. Uh, so there was this competition where uh, where scientists would come up with uh, which, with algorithms which predict the uh, three dimensional shape from the from the sequence of amino acids in the protein. And they were like every two years they would have a benchmark. They would try to you know make have a competition and see how how well the, their systems are doing. And uh, uh, in 2018. Uh, uh, um, there was a big, uh, there was one entry which scored uh, much higher than the others, and two years later they uh, they got like uh, to uh, to a score of ninety percent, you know, out of hundred, which is very close to you know to to kind of perfect. And uh, so this system uh, it was called AlphaFold and AlphaFold Two, and it was developed by people from uh, DeepMind, which is a subsidiary of Google. And uh, and so now uh, in you know this this is at the level that uh, that this like. Uh, by, fa- by basically a factor of, or two, of two better than what we were able to do before. Like I think before that uh, breakthrough, the scores were somewhere in the 40s, so about 40. Now the score is you know 90 or a bit higher, and so so this makes the the this makes it like com- very usable and very pra- uh, in, in practical applications that I mentioned before in, in biomedicine and. Uh, uh, as far as I uh, as far as I know, the, this uh, program has been applied to a, to a lot of uh, protein sequences, and their three dimensional structure has been predicted. And this database has been made uh, uh, available for for scientific applications. So I think this is a big thing. People can't easily do it. It's not something that you know. It's just like doing things that pe- people can, but just uh, but faster. This is something that. Uh, determining protein structure is a very slow and tedious uh, work, uh, which involves like a, a freezing a protein and taking an electron uh, microscopy of it, and so on. So it's 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 long and expensive. Now we can we can we have a shortcut, and so that's amazing. I think. And, and does it? I don't know if you know this, but I can imagine because such an application will will predict what the folding will be. Is that then always correct? Probably not because it's ninety percent accurate. Yeah, there are some say. there are yeah. some cases where it's not. Uh, uh, again, it's not really exactly my field. You know, I kind no. of uh, I, I kind of follow biology, but not not, uh, not all the intric- intricate details. But it's uh, definitely much 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 better than what we could do before, and it's uh, you know much cheaper and uh, and faster. So we can. Uh, uh, these predictions are, I think, super useful. You can you can always like if you if you if you have some candidates candidate proteins, you can okay. narrow them down, and then you can then you can you know like do the microscopy work to actually determine the actual thing. Right, because that would that would be my question. Because if you still have to check all of them, but you you have the pre selection now, which yeah. which which helps. Okay, anything you want to add to that? Or, uh, no. no. <laughs> so. Um, what I was wondering here, well, I had actually two questions left, but we are running almost out of time. So maybe we should go towards running off. Can you tell me a bit about your own work uh, for, let's say, the next year or two or three? Not 10 years, because I know that you're going to make movies then. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sure, I'll, I'll start off. Yeah, so, sure. um, yeah, as I, as I said, I'm generally interested in sort of problematic algorithms. Uh, so work that I've been doing before is looking at, uh, for example, how algorithms can infer things about us uh, given our language use. So let's say that you post a bunch of social media posts based on the, this, it might be able to predict certain things that might be used for sort of good applications, right? So, um, you know, if we want to know some demographic information about you, then like age and and sort of 
education level might be relevant as as sort of an easy way to um, to collect data, but obviously there's ways that that this can be used in more malicious ways. Uh, some direct examples always if you if you let things like let's and I'm not saying that these are necessarily accurate or good algorithms, but there is definitely work that tries to, for good causes, try to predict if if you suffer some sort of um, you know mental disorder or you know depression. Um, these things are are relevant to study for for certain areas of research. Um, that can be done based on your language use. You might not want to reveal those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So providing some sort of insight into this and ways to not share that information is relevant. So that's things that I'm trying to, or have been trying to study based on sort of changing your language use. But I think it's a much more broader thing where um, <clears throat> this is a very direct example of how like an algorithm might be employed for not so nice things, but a lot of things are also hidden. So, you know, the, the internet is mostly driven by how we're shown particular content. So ads or, or some ranking of their, uh, of, of, you know, even social media posts. And this in like creeps in very uh, sort of, you know, things that, that, that don't necessarily, you know, I wouldn't want to use the word manipulate, but it certainly exposes yeah. us to a very limited set of things. And we're not really sure how, what, drives that and and who sort of what and i'm sure that some of the companies that provide these things also don't know uh but it's very it's very understudied sort of how um how these things affect us if if there is some sort of you know bias in in these very large systems um so that will be what i'll be studying in the next few years or at least starting this because mm -hmm. it's a very large endeavor uh, <laughs> very socially relevant. <laughs> yeah. So this is uh, the TLDR, I guess. Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, for for me, uh, my main focus of, uh, of research is uh, is on on language, especially spoken language. Uh, so we mentioned that there, there's been a lot of progress on many language related applications, such as translation or recognition of uh, of speech. Uh, and uh, however, the way it works is uh, is, is a little bit uh, you know maybe not ideal. So, for example, the what we what uh, what we typically do in order to train a, a deep learning speech recognition system, we uh, we give it a lot of uh, audio with uh, with speech in it, and we give it the corresponding uh, transcription. So, you know, what is like the written version of the same thing, and uh, you know, if you if you give it like I don't know. Uh, a few uh, a few tens of uh, thousands of hours, it will it will figure out, and you, and you can have a system which transcribes spoken speech. But of course, you know, like if you look at how kids learn, learn to speak, they don't really need that much information, and not yeah. that not you know they, they don't need like this kind of very close supervision. They don't get like written and uh, and spoken input which closely match at the same time. It's just. You just they, they just like uh, listen to people chatting maybe try to say something themselves they figure out that like what people are are saying in a certain situation maybe is related often to that situation in some way uh, but it's not clear exactly how how often and you know what aspects of that situation it's related to so so ki kids when they are learning a, a language they are they are very good at like you know working with very noisy very kind of uh, loosely uh, correlated data and relatively little data, right? So, we, so, so you know, like a few, a few thousand hours should be uh, is basically enough uh, for a kid to start, you know, speaking and in, in, in reasonable in reasonable way. And so we are, uh, me and, and and my colleagues uh, who are working together with me, trying to kind of figure out how we can make uh, deep learning systems which are approximate some aspects uh, of this uh, of this human uh, ability. And so, yeah, going back to movies, we were we are currently, for example looking at children's cartoons and to trying to use children children's cartoons uh, such as peppa pig to uh, as a kind of a testing ground for that for that idea so in a, in a cartoon there is always the characters are speaking the car uh, the cartoon depicts some everyday situations and like uh, we just give this data to the computer and try to uh, to uh, to make a system which which learns language from that kind of input right like it's it's uh, it's the system should be understanding like which concepts are present in a in a spoken mm -hmm. sentence just by listening to these sentences and, and and seeing the scenes that are that are uh, 
were, were these uh, sentences spoken in the in the cartoon and uh, hopefully we will in, in the future kind of move to more realistic uh, uh, movies and maybe uh, uh, maybe into also like more real world interaction that uh, that is definitely something that I'm looking forward to. Okay. Well, thank you. You both now gave me an ID for a follow-up <laughs> follow podcast, but then I can ask you who I should invite for those because mm. probably should not repeat this. But, uh, but uh, is there anything more you want to add? If not, then thank you for being here.